morning. As Bishop of the Episcopal Diocese of Washington and Dean of Washington National Cathedral, and on behalf of Bishops Theodore Eastman, Cathedral Vicar, and George Packard, Bishop for the Armed Forces, I welcome all of you to this great cathedral, the sixth largest cathedral in the world. As we gather together in prayer, the spoken word and music to celebrate the dedication of the National World War II Memorial. I also extend a very special welcome from all of us and from a grateful nation to former President George Herbert Walker Bush and his First Lady and ours, Barbara Bush. This is not a ceremony that is seen by a few. This is a celebration witnessed across this great nation and throughout the world. And for us in this nation, it is watched by those who have been affected by the sacrifices made by those who have gone before us and who are known as the greatest generation. 400,000 men and women sacrificed their lives and many thousands of others were wounded. Hundreds of thousands left their jobs, millions, to enlist in the Army, the Army Air Corps, the Navy, Marines, and Coast Guard. While hundreds of thousands more worked side by side back home to support the war effort with their unselfish industry. Today we honor them all. We worship this morning in this magnificent cathedral as a people who continue to live into our forebears' vision of a free nation engaged in the continuing pursuit of life, liberty, and happiness. A vision preserved by those who gave so much of themselves and their lives during World War II. Thank God for them and thank God for this great nation. Would you please join me in solemn prayer? Most gracious and loving God, we thank you for gathering us today securely in your presence as a mother eagle so gathers her young under strong protective wings. We give thanks to you for the men and women who valiantly served their country unselfishly during a time of great trial and tribulation. We remember them today for their great sacrifices, their courage, their forbearance, and in all things their efforts to bring peace and tranquility among all your children who define your human family and who are blessed in your sight. Their sacrifice will never be forgotten. We remember them all today and we ask you to bless them, both the living and the departed, and their families. May what we say and do this day be pleasing in your sight, and may we continue to find ways through their great sacrifice to seek peace in our time as they so desperately sought it in theirs. And may you continue to bless, preserve, and keep us all as the people of your eye, loved and sustained, lifting up this great nation also as a bright beacon of hope in a too often darkened world. All this we pray in your name and in your living presence. Amen.
On behalf of our American Battle Monuments Commission, the executive agency authorized by Congress to establish a World War II memorial, I wish to thank our Washington National Cathedral for this special service of celebration, thanksgiving, and remembrance. At 2 p.m., our National World War II Memorial will take its rightful place on the Mall, precisely on the center line between two memorials honoring Washington and Lincoln. This morning, I would like to share with you sentiments of our 1st and 16th Commanders-in-Chief, who I know will be watching this dedication and saying a heartfelt welcome. On the occasion of his retirement from command of the Continental Army, General George Washington wrote to the governor of each state, and these are words from his benediction. I now make it my earnest prayer that God would have you and the state over which you preside in his holy protection, that he would incline the hearts of the citizens to cultivate a spirit of subordination and obedience to government, to entertain a brotherly affection and love for one another, for their fellow citizens of the United States at large, and particularly for the brethren who have served in the field. And finally, that he would be most gracious, graciously be pleased to dispose us all to do justice, to love mercy, and to demean ourselves with that charity, humility, and pacific temper of mind which were the characteristics of the divine author. Without a humble imitation of these things, we can never hope to be a happy nation. Grant us these supplications, O Lord, God of the universe. And remembering Abraham Lincoln, we all are reminded of his commitment in the aftermath of the carnage at Gettysburg. It was there that the president of our young and divided nation said, we here highly resolve that these dead shall not have died in vain, that this nation under God shall have a new birth of freedom, and that government of the people, by the people, and for the people shall not perish from this earth. It has been within the spirit of this solemn pledge that our nation has sent its most precious treasures, its sons and daughters, to human conflicts beyond our shores, not to seize, not to subjugate, not to occupy, but to preserve their rights the losses have, have been staggering. As you have heard, 400,000 of our precious sons and daughters died. Another 700,000 were wounded. And also, quite significantly, there are 78,000 from World War II who are still missing in action. Let me quote now from the words permanently etched, permanently etched in the granite at the adult monument stone of our World War II memorial. Here in the presence of Washington and Lincoln, one the 18th century father, the other the 19th century preserver of our nation, we honor those 20th century Americans who took up the struggle during the Second World War and made the sacrifices to perpetuate the gift our forefathers entrusted to us, a nation conceived in liberty and justice. God bless and guide our great nation, our land of the free, but may we always remember only so long as it remains the home of the brave. From the book of Isaiah, 
Praise be thou, O eternal, our God, ruler of the universe, who has sanctified us with ordinances and instructed us to engage in the words of Scripture. The 40th chapter, the 28th verse. Have you not heard? Do you not know? The eternal is the everlasting God, creator of the ends of the earth, who does not faint or grow weary, whose understanding is unsearchable, who gives power to the faint and strengthens the powerless. Even youths will faint and be weary, and the young will fall exhausted. But those who wait for the Eternal shall renew their strength. They shall mount up with wings like eagles. They shall run and not be weary. They shall walk and not be faint. So pasuk the end of the reading. reading from the book of Ecclesiasticus. Let us now sing the praises of famous men, our ancestors in their generations. The Lord apportioned them great glory, his majesty from the beginning. These were those who ruled in their kingdoms and made a name for themselves by their valor, those who gave counsel because they were intelligent those who spoke in prophetic oracles, those who led the people by their counsels and by their knowledge of the people's lore. They were wise in their words of instruction, those who composed musical tunes or put verses in writing, rich men endowed with resources, living peacefully in their homes. All these were honored in their generations and were the pride of their times. Some of them have left behind a name so that others declare their praise. But of others, there is no memory. They have perished as though they never existed. They have become as though they had never been born, they and their children after them. But these also were godly men whose righteous deeds have not been forgotten. Their offspring will continue forever, 
and their glory will never be blotted out. Their bodies are buried in peace, but their names live on generation after generation. Here ends the reading. What a beautiful day and what a beautiful setting to say thank you to all those who served in World War II and to say a special thanks to the National Battle Monuments Commission led by General Kelly and to Senator Dole and all the others who have worked to make this monument a reality. Three magnificent monuments have long beautified our capital city and reminded us of great events and great men which shaped our nation in the 18th and 19th centuries. The Jefferson and Washington monuments remind us of the 18th century's bold, daring declaration of independence, the Revolutionary War to gain our freedom, and the work of those nations' fathers of ours to found a nation-state and give us a constitution guaranteeing the rights and freedoms our citizens enjoy and which are the envy of most of the world. The Lincoln Memorial reminds us of the 19th century's great trial for the nation and the man who led us when we struggled to affirm that we are one nation and that our Declaration of Independence was true and that all men are truly created equal with certain unalienable rights. Today we will dedicate a monument to America's 20th century efforts in World War II an event which too shaped our nation, but which also, both literally and figuratively, took the whole world apart and put it together again in a different form. This new monument isn't to glorify war, but it's to recognize the defining event of the 20th century and the overwhelming effort of the American people and their armed forces. Over 12 percent of the population served in the armed forces, in contrast to about 1 percent serving today. While most of the able-bodied 18 to 35-year-old males uh, were in uniform, and they are the traditional heart of the American factory and farm workers, American industry was engaged in a huge effort with a huge influx of new workers, mostly women, arming us and our allies. Many shipyards were producing a ship each week. Aircraft factories were producing nearly 100,000 airplanes a year. Countless tanks, trucks, and cannons rolled off assembly lines operating 24 hours per day. Our farms were feeding us and our allies. Fifty percent of the economy was going to the war effort. Nearly everyone was involved, either fighting supporting the fighters or supporting those who supported the fighters. A million Americans were casualties. Over 400,000 died, as, been, as has been mentioned. As President Roosevelt said in one of his early post-Pearl uh, Harbor addresses to the nation, we are now in this war. We are all in it, all the way. Every single man, woman, and child is a partner in this most tremendous undertaking in American history. We were led by giants, giants in the White House, giants in the Congress, and giants in the armed forces. Our leaders made bold, courageous, and very risky decisions, but those leaders were also fallible humans whose decisions and plans weren't always perfect and, and didn't always pan out the way they thought they might. We who carried out their decisions were also fallible humans. 
And certainly we didn't do everything right, and, or as well as we might have. There were mistakes and lapses of courage and judgment. Nevertheless, both nationally and individually, we acted responsibly, and we did what we could to right what went wrong. The wrongdoers, whether soldiers who committed crimes against noncombatants or war profiteers at home, were prosecuted and punished. The blood and the bravery and the sweat of the many washed away the stain of the few who dishonored the nation and its armed forces. The nation's unity remained intact during the darkest, the very darkest of times, and through some truly dreadful defeats, yet the relentless march to victory continued. Sixty years ago today, America and her allies were engaged across nearly the entire globe. U.S. Army troops in the Pacific were battling along the north coast of New Guinea. Naval forces were engaged in great sea and air battles uh, in the Marianas as marine pre Marines prepared to assault those islands. Merrill's marauders and the other Army troops had joined British and Chinese allies in the China-Burma border region. Our Navy and Merchant Marine battled submarines to get supplies to us and our allies including the brave Russian forces fighting great battles in Eastern Europe. In Britain, hundreds of thousands of U.S. and British troops were preparing for the monumental invasion of Normandy eight days hence. American, British, air armadas were pounding targets in Germany and France. As for me and my comrades, we were with our division, the 34th, fighting in the Alban Hills on the approaches to Rome. By that time, we had been in combat nearly a year and a half in North Africa and Italy. And we had fought alongside Allied troops from Britain, France, Poland, New Zealand, Canada, India, Algeria, Morocco, Brazil, and even Italy, whom we had earlier fought against. It was indeed a world war. I, like most of my comrades, fought in those strange places because we had sworn to obey the orders of the President and the officers appointed over us, and not because we understood the grand vision our leaders had for a world embracing four freedoms — freedom of speech, freedom to worship, freedom from want, and freedom from fear. Those leaders recognized that when freedom is denied anywhere, it's threatened everywhere. The world created in that aftermath of World War II wasn't a perfect world. It didn't completely embody those uh, four freedoms, but it was a better world, and it did bring new freedoms and opportunity to hundreds of millions of people who hadn't before enjoyed it, including the peoples of our former enemy nations. Empire and colonialism were headed for history's dustbin, and America was headed into a new age of economic prosperity and growth with a new mantle for world leadership. Now we of the World War II generation are thinning, both in hairline and in our ranks, and probably everywhere but our waistline. And we are mindful that the freedom we enjoyed in our time was a dividend from the sacrifices and perspiration of our forebears. In World War II and the years that followed, we added our blood and sweat to the asset pool and we've now passed the baton to others. This new memorial will help all those who follow remember the nation's efforts and sacrifices in our time. Today, American soldiers, Marines, sailors, and airmen are again fighting difficult battles in strange places because they too swore an oath to obey the President and the officers appointed over them, and because those who lead us again believe that they have made bold, courageous, risky decisions to make the nation and the world safer places for all. We pray for their success and safety. Today, in this house of worship, let us thank Almighty God for this great nation and its heritage passed to us. Let us pray that God will keep us one nation, united, freedom-loving, and respectful people, with the spirit of wisdom and dedicated to the rule of law. Let us ask for the Lord's blessing and, and guidance upon those who govern the United States and upon all those who defend her. Before we move to the dedication ceremony for this new monument, 
Let us also pray, as Thomas Jefferson asked, that our nation will pledge eternal hostility to every form of tyranny over the mind of man and our fellow humans. from the Gospel of John. I have said these things to you that my joy may be in you and that your joy may be complete. This is my commandment, that you love one another as I have loved you. No one has greater love than this, to lay down one's life for one's friend. Here ends the reading.
Dallas for that magnificent music and thank Bishop Chain and everybody else involved in opening this majestic cathedral to this wonderful event. Let me start by saluting uh, Fred Smith and General P.X. Kelly, Marcy Kaptur, the Congresswoman whose legislative initiative made all this memorial possible, uh, and particularly Bob Dole, whose leadership has done so much to fulfill the dream. Uh, everyone pitched in and helped on this, various committees, uh, seeing this amazing project through, and in, do and in so doing, uh, helping our nation honor its solemn obligation never to forget. Today I bring greetings from my dear friend, Bob's dear friend, Jerry Ford, President Ford, himself a World War II veteran, uh, who regrets that he was unable to be here today. Uh, and who asked me to extend his warmest wishes to his fellow veterans. It's altogether fitting and proper that we gather this weekend and in this place to memorialize the people, places, and events that forever changed the course of history and turned back a rising tide of tyranny when the fate of the free world hung in the balance. The passage of time makes it easy to forget that the 1930s and the 1940s were decades of great danger and uncertainty in our world. Led by fanatics, the armies we faced routinely and systematically killed without remorse, seeking to destroy the institutions and freedoms that we've always held so dear. And such was their brutal, thoroughly evil nature that in hindsight their actions almost seem surreal, as if they occurred in another lifetime. And yet you need look no further than to the death camps in Auschwitz and Treblinka or to the massacre at Nanjing, halfway around the world, to understand the true depths of their depravity. Defeating them would prove to be a difficult and deadly enterprise Winston Churchill often remarked to General Eisenhower that we must take care that the tide does not run red with the blood of American and British youth or the beaches be choked with their bodies. In the end, the price of victory was indeed high, as Churchill feared. But today we also know that the price of defeat surely would have been far greater. All that stood between the Axis powers and their evil objectives was an ill-prepared, somewhat disparate alliance of free peoples, nations that were generally slow to anger and perhaps, if you look back, even reluctant to fight at first, but who, once provoked, were unrelenting in their mission to see justice prevail. Such was the case when history beckoned some six decades ago and thrust the next generation of American heroes into the crucible of war. These were average men and women who lived in extraordinary times. No matter their rule on the home front uh, or on the front lines, they were united. No matter the danger or hardship, they responded with exceptional bravery. Indeed, 60 years ago this very week, and what history will surely mark as one of the great achievements of mankind. Two million sons from 15 countries jumped into flak-filled skies and a blood-soaked surf and met death on an even plain. And on a horrible day filled with destruction, helped save the world. And meanwhile, halfway around the world, the same scene of selfless sacrifice played out on the seas, on the volcanic beaches of Iwo Jima and Guadalcanal and Tarawa, as our Navy, having recovered from the devastation of Pearl Harbor, was well on its way to defeating the forces of imperialism in Asia. Tom Brokaw, in that wonderful book uh, called The World War II Veterans, The Greatest Generation, I understand that. And I respect that enormously, given the scope uh, and the size and the stakes of the war that General Vesey so eloquently referred to a few minutes ago. 
But let me differ just a tiny bit. The men and women who make up our all-volunteer forces fighting today in Iraq and Afghanistan and serving with honor and integrity in countless other locations around the world are every bit as great as any generation that preceded them. The comforts of modern society have not lessened the burdens that they have freely borne, just as their families have not been spared the constant pain of separation. The scope of World War II may, may have been greater, but the anxiety and the pain uh, is no greater. To each of those who serve, serve now, no less a debt of gratitude is owed. An inherent part of our birthright as Americans is a sacred, a sacred duty to defend freedom. And today, we as Americans now facing this new enemy and in international terror can take solace that despite the dangers we still face in our world, a new band of brothers has stepped forward and answered this timeless, noble cause. This new generation loves America just as much as the patriots who fought in World War II, Vietnam, Korea, Desert Storm, and everywhere in between. And so tonight, when you go to sleep and say your prayers of gratitude for those who served so many years ago uh, in World War II, remember, too, that at that moment, there are young men or women halfway around the world, sitting alone in the dark, waiting to go out on patrol. Uh, they may be tired, even a little bit scared, but every day they put on their uniform uh, and they lay their lives on the line for each of us to keep us free and safe. They not only make us proud, despite the uncertainty of the times in which we find ourselves, they also inspire us and give us confidence in our future. The same kind of confidence that these Congressional Medal of Honor winners uh, gave, our, gave our nation when they gave uh, that tribute, that devotion, many, many years ago. And so while it is proper that we pause to look back and reflect on the past heroism, one great generation of American patriots, and while we celebrate the long overdue dedication of a national World War II memorial, let us also not be afraid to look forward with renewed faith, hope, and courage that America's best days are yet to be. May God bless those who serve. May God bless those in the greatest generation who honor our country with their service. Thank you.
Almighty God, we acknowledge that you are truly gracious and your loving mercy bestows upon us peace that passes all understanding. We offer our gratitude for lives of heroic service to God and country during World War II. Some are legendary, their place in history secure. Few four army chaplains who surrendered their life jackets so that others might live are immortalized in one of this cathedral's stained glass windows for the entire world to see. Their heroism as the Dorchester sank in the icy waters of the Atlantic present the army and the chaplaincy at its highest and best. Others who sacrificed much may not be as celebrated by human history, but as the light shines through that breathtaking stained glass window, so the light of your approval shines through the legacy of their selfless service. They stormed the beaches, marched through the mud, were forged in the fire and set nations free, where millions were gripped by the iron bands of hatred, genocide, and oppression. Our soldiers unlocked those chains and released them to freedom, dignity, and liberation. Their struggle is our struggle. Their sacrifice is ours today. In the war against tyranny and terrorism, we implore your continued divine assistance so that goodness would prevail and peace would be the legacy of all the peoples of the earth. Amen. And now we continue with a prayer for those who served in the sea services in World War II, those brave servicemen and women described by the psalmist as those who go down to the sea in ships, the brave men and women of the Navy, the Marine Corps, the Coast Guard, and the Merchant Marine. Let us pray. Almighty and eternal God, today we gather as one nation, united at this one moment, to honor those who, in the words of Abraham Lincoln, have laid so costly a sacrifice upon the altar of freedom. Today we remember the hundreds of thousands of Americans in the Second World War who responded to our nation's call to arms at a time of great national peril. We are thankful for the millions of family members and friends who sacrificed so much as their loved ones endured the pains of war. These American patriots fulfilled a moral obligation to defend freedom, to fight tyranny, to eradicate genocide and evil in order to establish a just and lasting peace in their troubled world. We mark in a special way our service members who served in the Navy, Marine Corps, Coast Guard, and Merchant Marine. From land, air, and sea, they fought valiantly in far-off climes and places like the steamy jungles of Guadalcanal, the fiery skies over Midway, the black sand beaches of Iwo Jima, the perilous seas of the Leyte Gulf, and on the bullet-filled beachheads of Anzio. And today we are equally mindful of the brave servicemen and women who walk in harm's way at this very hour so that we might enjoy the freedoms and liberties of a people who live in a free world. Lord God, you have truly blessed the United States of America with men and women of incredible valor, where honor, courage, and commitment are hallowed words. We pray for the strength and courage of a conviction to follow in the footsteps of the greatest generation. May their sacrifices inspire our generation and generations yet to come. And may the dedication of this new memorial bring overdue recognition for all of their labors and may this time of prayer and thanksgiving draw all of us closer to you, our God, the author of all that is good, all that is just, and all that is truly free. Amen.
occurred to me in this great service that there's another group that we've not mentioned, those who returned from this war and whose lifespans did not reach this glorious day. My father is in that number. I know John Chain's father is too. What noble service, what noble people. Let us pray. Lord, though this war is past, its great legacy is ever with us. We gather in your sight now with quieter eyes about it all and survey the years of a generation which has gone before. They were called forth in their unhesitating response to a world disrupted and disheartened. They faced the darkness. Through this generation, light and redemption embraced the world. Their conviction amidst family and community was formed by a country of adoption or birth, Americans all. A place, Lord, you have blessed not only with the riches of natural beauty and resource, but with the riches that can come from men and women in love with the dream of freedom and justice for all. Through stamina of spirit, they found that by parting the clouds of despair, a glimmer of hope for the future would appear. By your hand, they achieved greatness by living courageously at home and abroad in spite of fear. Thank you for giving us this greatest gen generation as examples at this precise moment in history. Help us, O oh Lord, to be a wise people, a courageous people, a nation who, despite current fears that beset us, which lives with its anxieties, may fear not become fearsome among us. We learned in part from them that our faith will never grow beyond our confession of confidence in you. Help us to find and rely on those reservoirs of faith once again. We stand before you in this open moment. We ask this in your holy name. Amen. May the God of righteousness make us a people passionate for justice. May the God of compassion enable us to suffer with all who are afflicted. May the God of mercy teach us to forgive those who have done us harm. May the God of peace grant us tranquility in our hearts and concord among the peoples of the earth. And may the blessing of a gracious and loving God be upon us, upon this nation and its leaders, and upon all of God's world, now and forever. Amen.